I pray today we could see your face. I pray today would be a day of salvation. I pray pray today it would be a day in which your presence is so near that joy springs out. God, we hunger not for religious service. We hunger to, to meet you. And I pray for that. So, God, may, may we find you as we search for you with all of our heart. So I'm just um, boldly asking for this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, yeah, if you could get the... Uh, I, I'm kind of out of my comfort zone a little bit because um, I, I have a normal style of preaching. We're gonna, can you put it up here a little bit? Um, we have a normal style of preaching in which I try to take one idea and, and go around and around and around it. So at the end you go, okay, that's what he was talking about. And so really kind of share, share one idea or one story or one thought. Um, today what I want to do is, is um, really begin to teach on something that's um, going to take a long, long time to teach about. Today what I want to teach about is the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it's going to take a few weeks for us to try to get through this. So it's going to be some teaching on this. But uh, know this, that never um, do we get into the Word of God, do we never get in there and learn something without it being applicable to our life and something that we're accountable for after uh, we get done. Uh, So the basic idea today is this. Everybody is filled with something. What are you filled with? Um, You can tell what you're filled with when you get bumped. And uh, everybody's filled with something. Can you imagine what your life would be like if you were filled completely with the Holy Spirit? That the Holy Spirit, every time you get bumped, the Holy Spirit uh, came out of your life. Um, I I have been challenged by my family to share this story. It's the story of the week. You know, they say I I have to do it. Usually I tell stories that make others look bad. Um, Unfortunately, they're like, Dad, if you're real, you got to tell this story. And I got a little chippy at a softball game this week. So there, that's it. <laughs> you know, somebody said something to me, and I said something to somebody, and then somebody said something back to me, and then I said something, and then somebody said something to me, and then I thought, I, this is getting crazy. We've gone back and forth so many times. What do you do when every time you say something bad to somebody else, they say something bad to you, and it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse? And I didn't know how to get out of it. And so I just did this. (laughs) And I'm really sorry about that. I I wish I felt worse about it than I really do. (laughs) That's the bad, that's the thing I've been repenting of all week long is that, you know, everybody's filled with something. I I literally went home from that going, ah. Would the Holy Spirit have done that? Was that the Holy... Ruth says yes. No, (laughs) Ruth, no. No. The Holy Spirit would not have done that. Uh, I think there's a time to stand up for truth. I think there's a time, you know, to to not be wishy-washy and everything. But I had an attitude, and that's wrong. Everybody's filled with something. What are you filled with? And you can't tell what you're filled with until you get bumped, until you get something, something comes across in your life. And when you get bumped, you can tell what you're filled with. What would it be like? Just imagine for a second what it would be like if you were filled completely with the Holy Spirit. And I want to express this, that you don't have to achieve that. That's not something that the great saints of the faith, they after you spend 40 years with God, that you, it's not something to be achieved, it's something to be received. There's a big difference. Um, if you have to feel like you have to work for it to a place where you can be filled with patience and fruit and all of that, that you, you got it wrong. The Holy Spirit is to be received. So we're going to kind of work through that here today. Um, first, first beginnings of teaching. Did you see the front of the bulletin? Um, if you need magnifying glass, because to, to actually read the attributes of the Holy Spirit. This is a wonderful job. I believe Caitlin Esch is the one that, if, you, if nobody, if anybody knows Caitlin Esch, she's the one that, that drew this up and painted it and everything. It's beautiful and describes what it would be like when the Holy Spirit just begins to take control of our lives and do things uh, in our lives. Um, so I want to begin to teach for a few weeks on the Holy Spirit. The first scripture I want us to look at is called a Trinitarian verse. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 13. 
Now, don't go to 1 Corinthians 13. What's that? That's the love chapter. Everybody goes to 1 Corinthians 13, but this is 2 Corinthians 13, the last verse. Actually, the last verse of uh, 1 and 2 Corinthians. It says, May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. How is Jesus Christ described? As grace. That's a free gift. Everything that Jesus paid for was a free gift. You can describe, um, summarize Jesus by the word grace. And the love of God. Oh, how's God described? Um, some of you think he's a tyrant. Some of you think, you know, judge. But the, in this verse, the primary description of God is the love of God. Um, and it says, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Um, have you ever experienced true fellowship? It's friendship. Um, uh, to the nth degree. It's when you can bear your soul to somebody when uh, they know what's going on in your heart, you know what's going on in their heart, that the, 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 the description of the Holy Spirit is fellowship, where um, Jesus Christ paid so that the Holy Spirit can live in us, not be around us, but be in us. So here's the first description I want you to understand about God. It's from this, from this um, that the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. It's very important for us to understand this because um, some of you uh, might understand God as, you know, you understand Jesus was God, or you understand that God the Father, but you don't understand that the Holy Spirit is God. And this Trinity formula kind of looks like this. You can draw a triangle. This is the symbol of the Holy Spirit, where the description of who God is, this is God. There's only one God, but that God is made up of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. It, the only way to describe God, the only way God could describe himself is to de describe himself in relationship terms. It's that God is a relationship, even among himself, and he desires relationships with us. So how many gods are there? One. It's very important to understand. There's just one God, but that God is made up of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, there's another verse that really, uh, it's a Trinity verse. It's the very first verse where the Trinity is seen. It's uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. So Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, uh, how many gods are there? Okay. Let us. Now, what's us? <laughs> Us is plural. If there's one God, why would you put it in the plural? Uh, because it's one of the very first mentions of the Trinity, the description of who God is. So then God said, let us make mankind in our own image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the air, over the livestock and over all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. You got this picture of God and he's, just, he's talking to himself. What should we do? Well, let us make man in our image. And then, um, so you got the, is describing the image of God. So God created mankind, uh, which is every human being that lives on earth. God created mankind in his own image. Do you know that you and I bear the image of God? Uh, I, the only way to describe this is, have you ever seen children that look like their parents? Or siblings that start to look like each other. And you can, you can just see the, the, the image of the family that's upon them. Uh, the way they smile or the way the nose is or anything. And so one of the children comes out. Oh, wow, he's got daddy's nose or mama's eyes or something like their grandpa. Or you start to see this image. You and I need to know this. That we look like God. We are not God. But we bear his image. There are attributes of God that are upon us. That we, we look like what God would... There's personality traits and all kinds of things that we bear the image of God even in, in our image. That we look like him. Now, it says in the image of God, he created them. Now, what is the number one description of what the image of God looks like? It's right in the verse. 
male and female, he created them. Oh, well, isn't that interesting? He could have used all kinds of attributes of human beings, but in this very uh, brief, but um, the, the beginnings of describing who you and I are, it's your male and female. We are created in the likeness of God. Somebody pointed this out. Very interesting to me. Now, um, hear this. I, I, I got to make sure everybody hears what I'm talking about right now. Is God male or female? Neither. <laughs> Neither. Don't ever think of God as male or female. God is not male or female. You really need to understand this. But the image of God has traits of being male or female. So when you think of God the Father, what kind of trait does that, what do you think of immediately? It's more of a masculine trait, which would be in God the Father. How about Jesus Christ as he lived on earth? Um, masculine or feminine? The masculine traits that, that live. How about the Holy Spirit? And somebody pointed out to me, and I, and I agree with them really clear, that if you begin to study the Holy Spirit, and you begin to look at the traits of the Holy Spirit, what you'll find is that there's just what, what we would characterize as feminine traits, you'll see a lot in the Holy Spirit. Um, but hear this, the Holy Spirit is not female anymore then uh, God the Father is male. There's, but there's male and female um, in, in all of this. I love how the image of God is described as male and female. Because this is really, really important for us to understand. Um, when you were born, I, I wasn't present for, well, a few of them I was. But uh, um, I'm almost guaranteeing this, that when you were born, one of the first phrases that came out of anybody's mouth in the room was, it's a boy or it's a girl. Um, it, isn't that the, um, the, the only one that in our family, that, that happened to five out of the six with Rebecca she, when she was coming out to say, it's a redhead. <laughs> <laughs> you know, her head came out first and, and uh, oh, it's a redhead, redhead? How do we get redheads, you know? And you know, we got a lot of them. Um, but uh, the first description of you and what you are is described as male or female. Now, uh, here, here's something I found. It came across my desk this week. I was, I was looking at something, and uh, there's a university out in California. Where else would it be? But a university in California, when, when they got to the place of gender identity, um, and check the box, which are you, male or female, do you know what? They have seven categories listed. Um, you know, yeah, you can kind of laugh about it at first, but do you know what? Anything that God creates, Satan tries to destroy, and he tries to distort. And it's really very important for us to understand this. And it's, and it's good for me to explain this to you. It's good for you to hear that God created you in his image, and you are either male or female. Um, do you know why why it's such a why it's such a blur thing going on? Is because a lot of times we get our identity like looking in a mirror. We get our identity by the way in which others speak about us and the way in which others talk about us. And especially now, every dad that's here, listen to this: your kids are understanding who they are primarily by the way you treat them, by the way in which you love them, by the way in which you speak to them. And you speaking words over them is so very critical. And so what happens when you, when you strip fatherhood from a nation? You get, you get a lot of blurred lines. You get a lot of problems that are, that are going on. He created us, male and female. Um, I wish I had heard this 25 years ago. It would have helped me be a better dad. But um, there's a father that I deeply respect who has... Uh, grown uh, women um, in his family, his children. Uh, and what he said was, every day I wanted to say two things to all of my daughters. You're beautiful and you're smart. He wanted to speak that over them. Because I'm telling you, um, the world is, is, just, is just beginning to distort and kill us, isn't it? Male and female, he created them. What's the image of God look like? Male 
and female. And when you want to get this image of God, you under, understand it this way. Now, this is really big. Um, so you got God the Father, and he's or God, and he's describing himself as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You've, he's describing himself as male attributes and female attributes, and this image of God is all over him, and there's a relationship, and there's communication that's going on in all of this. Have you ever heard in Scripture anywhere where, where one thing can be two things? Or two can be one. Um, it's you find it in marriage, where the two are now what one, where the image of God, where a male and a female can together become one. And I tell you that that's why there's such um, there's such a fight to distort this because marriage is is not about two two people who just love one another. This is about the image of God. This maleness and female. Don't, don't ever forget this. Don't forget who you are. Don't forget who God created you to be. And even begin to speak this over others and just describe who they are um, in this. So this, the presence of the Holy Spirit was powerful at creation. So we got the Holy Spirit is God. The second one is the Holy Spirit is described as a deposit. Holy Spirit is described as a deposit. Um, we're going to find this in a couple places. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14. We'll look at it. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, at the moment in which you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, something happens. It says you were marked in him. The mark of God became on your life. You're marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. We're described, uh, the Holy Spirit's described as a deposit guaranteeing what's going to come one day in heaven. The presence of God in heaven is the, the fullness of God, and the Holy Spirit is just a little bitty taste of that, a little deposit of that. We also find the same truth found in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 22. Uh, he says, he set a seal of ownership on us. Isn't that wonderful? God says, you belong to me. You belong to me. He put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Also in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, verse 5. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God, who has given us the Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. So three times in Scripture, the Holy Spirit's described as a deposit. So I really believe I need to teach what a deposit is. Um, have you ever put a deposit down on something? Uh, you, were, you were committing to either buy something or lose your deposit, weren't you? You're saying, I am so serious about buying this house that we'll put a deposit down on this that's just guaranteeing that uh, we're going we're gonna to keep our word, we're going to keep our promise. So in every deposit, um, catch this, in every deposit there is a, a giver and a receiver. So it kind of goes this direction. Somebody gives the deposit, somebody receives the deposit. In the case of the Holy Spirit, who gives the deposit? Who gives the Holy Spirit? God. It was, how was it paid for? Jesus' death on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the Holy Spirit, for you to receive the Holy Spirit. The question is, God paid for it, or God gave it, Jesus paid for it. Have you and I received it? How do we receive it? We ask. We ask. We, that's as simple as we just ask for what is ours. God has paid for it. Jesus has paid for it. And we now receive it by asking. Uh, there's a giver and a receiver. And Jesus has paid for that deposit. The Holy Spirit is the deposit of what is to come. Yesterday I uh, did a wedding uh, for somebody. And I do, when I was doing counseling with them, 
Uh, I, I, I give this same speech to people who are getting married. I say something like, hey, when are you going on your honeymoon? And uh, here's what everybody says. Well, yeah, we're leaving the day after at 6 a.m. out of Chicago. Everybody does this. I mean, it's like, I just, I love saying it because they, like, yeah, we're leaving at 6 a.m. out of Chicago. Is every flight out of Chicago at 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning? But uh, they're getting married, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Any little kids? Anybody planning? Uh, Caleb? You know? <laughs> Don't leave at 6 a.m. out of Chicago. Why, why is that? Because you're going to spend, um, you know, you're, you're going to be so tired and you're going to get in a fight right on your honeymoon because you're just absolutely exhausted. So uh, raise your hand if you fought in your honeymoon. You know, yeah, a lot of people fight on their but you're, you're stressed. You're tired. You're leaving out of Chicago at 6 in the morning. When do you need to be at Chicago for a flight out of... Yeah, you got to be there. Yeah, four thirty or five. So you're leaving. It's just so I tell this guy we're leaving at six a.m. out of Chicago. And I say, well, do this. At least book a hotel room right next to the airport, so that you don't have to think about traffic and leave early, wondering about wondering about all that. You can just get up at the last minute, go to the airport, and, and well, he texts me this morning. He did that. He texts me and says, guess how we spent our wedding night. Too much information. I didn't want to know. <laughs> we did what you wanted, Pastor. We drove to the airport. And we got there and went in and they said, we don't have a room for you. And he said they had paid for their whole room and they, all the rooms were booked. They had no room for them. They spent last night on the conference room floor um, with a couple blankets and a couple pillows. He said that we got, we slept for a couple hours on a conference room floor. Ew, you know, and, you know, won't that be, if she said to him, someday we'll laugh about this. <laughs> it wasn't last night, <laughs> you know. You know what? Um, can you imagine paying, f by the way, they did not get a refund. You're kind of shocked, aren't you, on that? Um, they paid for something and did not receive it. And every one of you are going, oh. they paid for something and did not receive it. And you're shocked. And I just want to say, Jesus, with his life, paid for you to receive the Holy Spirit. And, and we should be, oh, if we haven't received it. We, we, he paid for it. It is ours. It is better than any hotel room you could ever imagine. Jesus paid a deposit. He bought the Holy Spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance. Have you received it? Do you know it's yours? Do you know that he died for you? And when you believe, this is the one thing that you say, I, I want to receive the Holy Spirit because he's, he's bought that for me. Do you understand what this, this, what this means? All you, you don't need to achieve it. You don't need to say, I got to be good one day so I can get the Holy Spirit. No, you receive the Holy Spirit so that you can be godly, so that you can be full of peace and joy and patience. You don't try to be good so you can get good. You, do, you, know, you know, that's not how it works. You receive it so then you can become it. So he's God. He's a deposit. The deposit was paid for by Jesus Christ. Have you received it? Here is the way to tell if you received it. Everything the Holy Spirit does is new. That's a bad thing. It's new. <laughs> Everything the Holy Spirit does is new. Um, if you come to a church service and there's something that's not new in it, that means the Holy Spirit wasn't present. The Holy Spirit is constantly doing a new work. The, the Holy Spirit, wherever the Holy Spirit shows up, there's new life that's taking place. There's something that's being born. There's, there's newness that's taking place. So that you find in Genesis 1, chapter 2, or chapter 1, verse 2, talks about the Spirit of God hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God is there. And then before the, before the chapter is over with, bang, there's earth. When the Spirit shows up, 
something new is going to take place. Do you catch it? Where Spirit of God's hovering over the waters, and before the end of the chapter, there's earth that's created, then birds of the air and you know, the seas and all of that, and human beings. There's, there's creation that takes place. You also notice that the Holy Spirit showed up in um, Luke chapter 1, verse 35, the Holy Spirit showed up and didn't hover over the waters this time. The Spirit of God hovered over Mary. And it says, the, most, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The way in which conception took place with Jesus was the Holy Spirit showing up because when the Holy Spirit shows up, something is going to be born. The Holy Spirit showed up in Genesis and the earth and all of creation was born. Holy Spirit shows up in Mary's life. Something is born. When you had Jesus who died in, Rev in Romans chapter 8 verse 11, Jesus died and then the Holy Spirit showed up. And this says, And if the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. The Holy Spirit showed up on that Easter morning, and Jesus came back to life. And he says the same way he comes back to life, he wants to bring newness to you and me. And my favorite is in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit shows up in an upper room, and the Holy Spirit came upon them on that Pentecost day, and the church was born, because wherever the Holy Spirit shows up, something is born. Do you catch it? Something is born. Is there anything that's being born in you? Is there any newness that's coming out of your life? Is there, it's like when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you do things that you couldn't do on your own. There's, there's creation that takes place and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. How, have you, can you point to an area where life began because the Holy Spirit came upon you? If you, if you can't, then you need to know that Jesus died for that. He paid the price so that you could receive not only salvation, but you could receive the Holy Spirit today as a promise guaranteeing um, our inheritance in heaven one day. So I'm offering this to you. This will either be a snoozer of a sermon, saying, boy, you didn't have any great stories other than that guy sleeping on a hotel floor. Um, it, you'll either be talking about that story or you'll be talking about the day in which your life changed. And it's all up to you. Do you want to receive what Jesus Christ has done for you? I've heard people talk about, yeah, I've already received it. Um, you know, they, they talk about a day in which the Holy Spirit came upon them and this, this, this day in the past and this is what the evidence of everything that happened because of that. And I, I just with all kindness, I, I just want to say, Let's not talk about the past. Does the Holy Spirit live within you today? D does the Holy, is the Holy Spirit coming out of your mouth? Is the Holy Spirit coming out of your actions? Because when you get bumped, something's going to come out of you. And if it's not the Holy Spirit, then you're not filled with the Spirit. So today we offer because of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Can you imagine what your life would look like if the Holy Spirit was coming all out of you over every area of your life that can be received here today so Holy Spirit you are welcome in this place we thank you for what Jesus did for us it's, it could not be possible would not be possible if Jesus had not died for us so we celebrate you Jesus and thank you for what you did on the cross